Yeah, yeah, do it for the, do it for the people. Right, 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 right. That's really interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sometimes gets printed with E and sometimes without without E. So so the official spelling is this, but doesn't matter at all. So, uh, but now let's get to uh, my topic: uh, identity questions in Antoine Reicher. <clears throat> Born in Prague. Raised and educated in Germany, Anton Reicher developed a distinctive music theory with significant, if not revolutionary, novelties before moving permanently to Paris in 1808 for the second half of his life. In Paris, he first taught privately, then became professor of counterpoint at the Paris Conservatory in 1818. Reicher taught a large cohort of students besides the often mentioned celebrities like Hector Berlioz, Franz Liszt, and even the young Cesar Franck. One of his students, Daniel Jellensperger, who wrote a theory treatise following in Reicher's footsteps, mentioned in a review of Reicher's Traité de haute composition musicale that there is barely any city in France with at least one music teacher who calls himself a former student of Reicher, and that was written in 1829. <clears throat> in addition, he earned some success as a composer although most of his uh, compositions were forgotten before his death. Still, Reicher, as a theorist, experienced a steady Grado Stag Parnassum during his lifetime, climaxing in his appointment to the Institut de France on third attempt in 1835, one year before his death. <clears throat> Given these facts, <clears throat> well-known facts, and the considerable difference between his theoretical approach of his early years, let us call it the uh, revolutionary German theory, and the conservative tra trajectory of his French treatises, we can easily identify the var variety of cultural contexts that Reicher was engaged in. However, the challenge remains how to define Reicher's identities as a composer, theorist, and teacher. Researching this topic, I ran persistently into historiographic challenges. It was not easy for me to negotiate historical facts and influences to logically define our understanding of Reicher. For this reason, I see my paper today as an attempt to summarize some of the recent research on questions of Reicher's identity and then to draw some preliminary conclusions that may lead to future considerations of this topic. After his death, Reicher's legacy was overshadowed by new developments. With the upcoming Romantic movement and the presence of the Neudeutsche Schule, his name descended to the roster of backbenchers in the history of music. Ironically so, as he was the one with who explicitly taught Berlioz on the list and implicitly favored a progressive attitude in music more than anybody else of his contemporaries. Negative comments by François-Joseph Vitis contributed to this massive decline. Referencing the Parisian treatise Cours de Composition Musicale of 1818, Fétis saw in Reicher's theory of harmony, quote, a conception of the least rational theory that could possibly be imagined, and the most deplorable return towards the crude empiricism of the old methods of the early 18th century. Another colleague of Reicher at the conservatory Conservatoire, uh, its director Luigi Carubini was also distant and very critical towards him. Given this level of criticism, studies on Reicher remained scarce for more than 150 years. Aside occasional articles, it took until the new millennium that Reicher received more attention from music historians and theorists on a larger scale. And here, just to survey, it's a lot of text. So. This resulted most notably in the excellent edition of Reicher's early unpublished and forgotten theoretical writings, which includes Reicher's entire German theory, edited by Erli Orion, Alban Rameau, and Herbert Schneider between 2011 and 2015, the first uh, mentioned here on the slide, uh, and the first conference exclusively dedicated to Reicher, which took place in Paris in 2013. <coughs> This three-day conference was organized in a fashion that fits our current topic of diverse cultural contexts and identities 
The first day, mostly dealing with Reicher's biography and aesthetics, took place on the top level of the beautiful Czech embassy near the Eiffel Tower. The second day, dealing with theory and analysis, took place on the first floor of the Sorbonne University. And the third day, focusing on Reicher's compositional style, was placed in the basement organ room of the new Paris Conservatoire at the Cité de la Musique. In his review of this conference, Christoph Flamm described these venues as a compelling symbol for Reicher's posthumous reception. Quote, such a three-step descent could even stand metaphorically for the abyss of oblivion into which Reicher fell a long time ago. <laughs> End of quote. This situation has changed drastically during the last decade. The Paris Conference Proceedings, published in 2015, and the mentioned edition, enabled the reconstruction of <coughs> Reicher's identity as a composer and music theorist based on solid source material. Another conference took place in Lucca in 2017, resulting in a volume of proceedings with a promising title, Ant Antoine Reicher and the Making of the 19th Century Composer, published in 2021. And finally, the proceedings of the conference in Brno, 2021, with the title Reicher as Visionary, is currently being prepared for among the broad research resulting from this new interest in Reicher are topics that explicitly refer to questions of Reicher's identity as a music theorist, such as, and that's the last section here of the, of the slide, uh, such as uh, Keith Chapin's article on Reicher's three identities of the learned musician, and Fabio Moravito's paper on making the modern composer in Haydn's image. I will focus on both articles here, along with Ellen Lockhart's article shown on the slide. Chapman identifies Reicher's three identities as learned musician, man of letters, and mathematician, scientist, philosopher. Each of these categories were present in 18th century society for those that deal with art and music, either theoretically or practically. And Reicher, according to Chapman, relates to all three categories. He further explains the nature of each of the three categories that can then be mapped onto Reicher's work in biography. The first category, learned musicians are, uh, that pursue music as a profession, quote, defined themselves through the cultivation of compositional sophistication. They are devoted to one essential question, how is it done? End of quote. The second category, the man of letters who pursues music as a matter of humanistic interest, is occupied with the, quote, cultivation of proper thought about music, asking the question of how or why did he do it, end of quote. The third category leaves any practical application of musical skill behind and asks, how does it work or what is it, end of quote. This latter category is of particular interest as Reicher mentions repeatedly his engagement in mathematical and scientific studies. While it is not explicitly connected with music, research has focused on Reicher's approaches to scientific methodology and mathematical organization of theoretical observations. Alan Lockhart, for instance, interprets Reicher's innovative graphs, form tables, and lists with scientific publications in France at the time. She sees parallels between the diagrams of musical forms in Reicher's treatises and the way French scientists of the period organized chemical elements, as Antoine Francois Comte de Foucault did in 1801, or depict, depicted families of insects uh, in treatises on zoology by Pierre André Latreille from 1802 on. The term idée mère that Reicher applies to this model of sonata form shows, according to Lockhart, parallels with the term O mer from Foucault studies in chem of chemical elements. Reicher's identity as a scientist philosopher clearly reaches back to his German period where associations with scientific methodologies, terms and tables can be found in his pedagogical compositions and his manuscript treatises. 
For instance, the famous description of the sonata form as concubinaire has its origins in his philosophical aesthetic comments to the 24 examples that he wrote most likely in Hamburg before the turn of the century. In the context of his suggestions for a modern revision of his Tempest sonata form, Reicher talks about talks around 1800 about a, uh, quote, composition that is organized in two main parts, end of quote, which is the German original of the uh, French term that later became famous through its use in the Traité de Mélodie, 1814, and the Traité de Composition Musicale. So the German version is Composition, das uh, die uh, uh, in zwei Teile gegliedert ist, two main parts. Um, <clears throat> However, the content of this term, concubinaire, uh, reveals the unique approach of progressive thinking that is typical for Reicher's German music theory. He describes the sonata form with a subsidiary theme in a chromatic third relationship. The principal theme is in D minor, whereas the subsidiary theme is in F sharp major. Reicher admits that this may seem quote, strange, but not unnatural, <coughs> end of quote. And he concludes, quote, it is a necessity to experiment in art everything that is appropriate to its nature, even connecting the most remote elements as far as one has the means to do so, end of quote. <coughs> Reicher's rejection of established key relationships of a sonata exposition is one aspect of his almost obsessive ambitions to overturn Critical, uh, traditional rules. Let's just listen to that. I talked about this piece in extensive, in, extensive in, 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 in another presentation and it will be published eventually. Um, so just here, the idea of going from D minor to F sharp major uh, with a very extensive transition, which reminds actually of another famous piano piece composed by a famous composer at around the same time. Let's just listen to the exposition, which is fairly short. Other as aspects of this revolutionary approach to music theory have been discussed widely, such as his use of irregular and compound meter. You could hear this here, um, a um, à la breve combined with 3 uh, 4. Um, the application of chromatic and enharmonic modulations, as well as extensive studies in motivic development and thematic variation. Most well known in this regard are his repeated attempts to establish a new method composition, published in various collections, again with extensive commentaries to reimagine the genre of the fugue with modern elements. The 36 fugues, 36 fugues, composé d'après un nouveau système, which were published in Vienna in 1803, have traditionally been a focus of musicological research on Reicher's identity as a revolutionary theorist. 
Oliver Vogel sets an extreme tone in his dissertation of 2003. He sees the composition of structure as evidence for a, quote, utopian mission of the fugue, which does not exclude acts of violence, end of quote. Identifying these fugues as, quote, revived creatures of a Frankenstein in music, end of quote. Others have put these fugues in various historiographic and theoretical perspectives, including their social contexts and political motivation. Ludwig Fincher interprets these folks, these fugues with their uh, seemingly odd juxtapositions of themes in remote harmonic key relationships uh, as products that, quote, lack the aura of the genre, end of quote. Stefan Kunze in 1968 even compares the innovativeness of Eicher's early fugues with the approaches to total serialism by avant-garde composers after the Second World War. Beethoven himself saw them as fugues that are no fugues anymore, and a critic in 1808 called these fugues outcomes of Reicher's attempt to get noticed, which resulted in caricatures of the fugue. The contemporary and posthumous criticism of Reicher's fugues could thus be read as a symptom of cultural anxiety. The fugues, as the epitome of strict composition and established rules idealized in Johann Sebastian Bach's work, is jeopardized by Reicher, who distorted its dignified identity by implementing chromatic key relationships, five four meters, and gallant sentence, sentence structures. By way of contrast, Reicher sees the fugue stuck in a tradition that prevented the genre from the adoption of modern compositional devices that would help the genre to become a visionary genre for the new century, and Reicher its visionary creator. Some scholars even attempted to associate this vision with revolutionary ideas. One might not agree with Vogel, who sees the Reicher of the early Hamburg and Viennese period as a representative of, of Bonapartistic thinking. However, Reicher's writings of these early years often combining humanistic, philosophical, and political considerations may allow the conclusion that Reicher defined the traditional fugue as a genre of anachronistic modes of power that were at odds with the revolutionary renewal of society at the time, at least as a hopeful utopia. According to this reading, the Reicher of the period around 1800 aspires to be the figure of the modern composers who overcomes the restrictions of musical traditionalism. This perspective reveals the mindset of a young theorist composer that rebels against restrictions of musical practice that prevented him from the career that he envisioned. Indicators for this mindset can be found in Reicher's autobiographical sketch from 1824, where he relentlessly criticizes the unfair musical management that prevents him from being a productive and successful opera composer. Consequently, so Reicher in his autobiography, he decided to withdraw from the public and live the life of the erudite scholarly theorist sitting at, his, sitting at his desk or at the piano with his students. This situation reflects Reicher's philosophy during the formative, his formative years, roughly 1798 to 1808, the decade from his time in Hamburg to the first stay in Paris to his Viennese period. This decade can be seen as the key to Reicher's identity. His autobiography and letters talk about this Viennese period as a period of studies and discussion with one central musical figure, Joseph Haydn. While Reicher sees Viennese musical life on a decline, he adores Haydn and constructs himself as an acolyte of Haydn advocating for his musical style and pursuing musical development that follows Haydn's footsteps. The dedication of his 36 fugues to Haydn thus is not just an admiration of the aging master, but program. Fabio Moravito concludes that, quote, Reicher's plan to gain enduring luminosity was to do to the fugue what Haydn had done to the string quartet. He wanted to become the father of the fugue by composing anti-fugues, or to say with Beethoven, eine Fuge, die keine Fuge mehr ist leaving a mark in changing the default of what a fugue was, end of quote. 
This is a striking idea, well supported by Morabito's arguments. Indeed, during the latter pe uh, Paris period, Reicher was seen as the representative of Viennese classical music through the spirit of Haydn. This might explain the mentality of traditionalism shining through the pages of Reicher's French treatises. The revolutionary spirit of the 36 Fugues was not opportune at the conservatory, and his Tritit Haute Composition Musicale tamely provides traditional rules about the fugue. He still mentions the fugue phrase, as he calls it in his treatise, as a modern alternative to the traditional fugue. However, this fugue phrase does not even come close to his early revolutionary experiments. To summarize my preliminary considerations, it remains problematic to speak about diverse identities regarding Reicher, as they can only share the surface, shape the surface of Reicher's occupation as theorist, composer, and teacher. His transformations from a young revolutionary in German lands under Napoleonic suppression to an established opportunist in post-Napoleonic France are harder to determine. Obviously, his role as a teacher at the Conservatoire allowed him to reintroduce the revolutionary Reicher of the German period under the official cover of the tamed French treatises. As we knew from reports by some of his students, Reichers did not follow strictly his treatises in his teaching, but included manuscripts from his early period. Thus, Reicher, the scientist and philosopher, relies heavily on his pedagogical experience and his compositional attempts. They are indivisible. Reicher's identity is probably better described as a complex, if not contradictory, identity defined by multiple layers that allow him to engage in a multitude of modes beyond the polished pictures of a theory professor at a renowned institution. Uncovering the subtle nuances of these various layers may allow us to better understand the complexity of Reicher's identity. Thank you. Very much, Frank. Um, if we could hold questions toward the end, we, uh, to the end, we can have uh, group questions for both presenters. That's okay. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Peter Martins, who is professor of music theory and associate dean of for faculty research and creative activity at Texas Tech University. Dr. Martins holds degrees in music and classics from Lawrence University and the University of Chicago. And in his edited translation of Isaac Vosius' um, The Song of Poetry and the Power of Rhythm has just appeared as part of the Rutledge series Music Theory and Britain, 1500 to 1700 Critical Editions. His talk today is entitled Isaac Vosius, Biography of a Music Theorist. We're quite uh, happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. I'll add my thanks uh, to Franks for the, the organizers of this um, working across societies and especially across budgets, uh, no, no small task, so thanks a lot for making it happen. Um, I've taken a cue from the, the session title here and, and added in kind of true 17th century fashion an alternative title to, to my talk. Um, it actually fits quite well, I think. So Isaac Vossius is, is hardly a household name in the world of music theory. If, you, if you've encountered this name at all before reading the program for this event, uh, you might be remembering him as quoted in, in George Houle's Meter and Music, 1600 to 1800. Uh, in that book, after, after a single sentence introducing the long quote from Vossius, which is uh, typical in its academic complexity, uh, Houle follows with a second and final sentence, the glib observation, he does not give musical examples. Um, that is one of the, uh, the challenges of the treatise. So the treatise from which Houle draws that extended quote in, in that work is entitled De Paul Martin Cantu at Virgus Rhythmi on the, the song or music of poetry and the powers of rhythm of 1673. Vossius' Vossius's name does not appear at all in the Cambridge history of Western music theory, and Bill Kaplan and, and Pat McCrellis' chapters <coughs> would have been the most logical places, nor does it appear in Roger Grant's more recent uh, book, Beating Time. Uh, now, 
Even though Vossius's opinions on Lupo Quayle were cited and even quoted extensively throughout the 18th century by authors such as Matheson, Dubot, Rousseau, and Forkel, I hasten to, to add that the omission by these contemporary authors really does their, their work no discredit. I don't recall myself exactly where or when I first came into contact with this author or this treatise, but I do know that it was uh, Tom Christensen's fault. Uh, in that it occurred during one of his seminars in the early years of the 21st century. Um, I phrase it that way with a mild note of blame, first because he's not here, uh, and second uh, because I've actually spent a good bit of time during the past 20 years or so grappling with my titular paradox. Is Isaac Vossius a music theorist? Is De Pomatum Cantu, his only treatise dealing with music, a work of music theory at all? So right off the bat, I'm going to give you uh, the two answers I've come up with. And then I'll work through those answers. I'll next highlight a few aspects of the treatise itself. And then we'll, we'll take a vote at the end. Um, although I'll be happy to entertain writing candidates uh, during the Q&A if you don't like either of my, my answers. So my, my first answer to the, 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 the overall question is, in fact, no. Uh, the treatise, De Pomatum Cantu, only had a life or, or only came to be at all due to Isaac's family legacy which gave him access to knowledge and to ways of knowing, access to, to people in positions of power, and access to publishing that was very unusual and highly privileged. In this view, he was an intellectual trust fund baby, a fund he lived off throughout his life, or at least until he received a new and more tangible trust fund by inheriting his father's library in 1650 at age 32, which was eventually sold in the early 18th century for close to $700,000 in today's money. Thus, the treatise, uh, again in this view, is the work of a classical dilettante, gate crashing from above, so to speak, and anticipating a sort of scholarly upper class twit of the year approach uh, that we might better recognize in 19th and early 20th century England, uh, an approach that merely regurgitates a, a loosely related concatenation of ancient topics and sources. Th this is your real cultural literacy test for, the, for today, by the way. So that's number one. Answer number two, also no, but, but maybe. So on the cusp of the Enlightenment, when this treatise was written, works on singular topics by polymath authors were increasingly rare. Had this treatise been written even a little earlier by one of the Galileis or Leonardo da Vinci, or certainly if it had been written a few centuries earlier by Hildegard von Bingen or the Iranian scholar Al-Biruni, or even earlier by Isidore of Seville or might even say Boethius, we would likely accept this treatise uh, as written without too much scrutiny. But in its own day, De Poematum Cantu, or rather the approach to scholarship that produced this treatise, was a relic. We get a sense that in some ways the author was as well. In Alexander Chalmers' early 19th century general biographical dictionary, we read that Vossius, quote, understood almost all the languages in Europe without being able to speak one of them well, who knew to the very bottom the genius and customs of antiquity, yet was an utter stranger to the manners of his own times. He expressed himself in conversation as a man would have done in a commentary upon Juvenal or Petronius. And in this scenario, I enjoy rather uh, comparisons with um, some of the Laputans from Gulliver's Travels who are so preoccupied with scholarly contemplation that they can't function in day-to-day -day life, but nevertheless control the intellectual life of their floating city. There is a, a, a tenuous connection there, but it's not one I can press very far. So in this view, Vossius was gatekeeping the knowledge and authority from the ancient world by any means possible, with music being just another tool to accomplish that goal. Yet, and here's the maybe, considered atemporally, the treatise can be read as an interesting encyclopedic and at times maybe even compelling work on rhythm, language, ancient instruments, uh, and a work that includes a, a, a curmudgeonly but well-informed critique of modern music. More on that view a bit later. Now, of course, Vossius couldn't have written this treatise a few hundred years earlier since it is absolutely dependent on the recovery and assembling of ancient sources in the 15th and 16th centuries and on the rigorous scholarly attention to those sources in the 16th and 17th. 
So to understand either his methodology, as I would say uh, number two is focused on, or his pedigree as in number one, let's, let's turn to a little biography finally here. So um, Isaac is born in 1618 into a scholarly family in the relatively new Dutch Republic, the relatively new new Dutch Republic. Uh, he was the seventh of nine, nine children, but was the oldest son. His father, Gerhard Clausius, was already at the time of Isaac's birth a significant figure in classical philology and biblical exegesis, and Isaac's early life was spent in Leiden, uh, where his father held prominent positions at the university as the head of the theological school and later as professor of rhetoric and professor of chronology and professor of Greek. Uh, then a little later, um, in Amsterdam, where, uh, again, the father Gerhard was the founding chair of history at the, the new university in Amsterdam at the time. And it's in that city uh, that Isaac uh, became head librarian at age 26. So Isaac was immersed in a highly literary and highly academic family culture. We catch a glimpse of home life in a 1641 letter that's addressed to uh, the then 23-year-old Isaac from a Swedish diplomat named Harold Appleboom, who writes, quote, in my eyes, your house is a temple in which her father is the oracle of all scholarship and where your brothers and you all participate as priests. He's trying to get him to come to Sweden, but still. <laughs> it's certainly evident that Isaac embraced the family trade, benefiting from his father's tutelage and example, but also from his father's reputation, which granted Isaac instant name recognition in and instant access to and mobility between European courts, universities, and governmental institutions. And as I've alluded to, his first position outside of the Dutch Republic was as librarian Greek tutor to Queen Christina of Sweden, where he went in, in 1648. He fell out with the Queen initially for financial reasons, but her conversion to Catholicism and subsequent abdication ended his employment there. And at that point, he returned to the continent and took up residence at The Hague, where, it so happened, Charles II was waiting out the protectorate with several royalists, one of whom was Henry Bennett, the future Lord Arlington, and the eventual dedicatee of our, our treatise today, De Pomat and Cantu. During these years, it may have occurred to Isaac that his patrimony was both a blessing and a curse. So with his father dead nearly 15 years, uh, Vossius actually received a, a bit of money and an offer of royal patronage in the form of a history professorship in Paris from Louis XIV. He, he turned it down. But the official offer letter from the French Controller General of Finance at the time was perhaps one such reminder of, of his patrimony, for better or worse. Quote, everyone knows that you worthily follow the example of the famous Vossius, your father and that having received from him a name which hath rendered him illustrious by his writings, you will preserve the glory of it by yours." Kind of a, a second phase of, of I guess, um, an academic dynasty, right? Preservation. His dad made it, and he, he can't better it, he can just preserve it. So let's take a moment to look at the respective output of father and son. And you might think I'm being cheeky here, but as many woodcuts and, and portraits we have of Gerhard Vossius, there are zero extant images that I've been able to find, uh, at least, of Isaac, which is rather surprising, as you'll see in a second, given uh, the volume of his output. So here are um, most of Gerhard Vossius' work, works. And I think you'll, you'll notice rather, rather quickly the consistency um, and his focus on rhetoric, theology, and, and history, um, especially of the ancient world. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a focused career, and it, it fits with his academic positions. Here are Isaac's works, which start off somewhat typically um, editions of, of classical works. There are some um, religious themes in there. He definitely did uh, get a lot of mileage out of, out of chronology. Uh, there was a lot of of kind of back and forth and, and arguing and fighting um, about some of his views on uh, chronology of, of the world and, and of the Septuagint. Um, but then he gets into some, you know, things we might not expect. Um, you know, light, uh, the, the tides, the motion of the seas and winds, the Nile River, then we have our, our music offering kind of in the middle. Um, as every good polymath uh, needs to do, a book of various observations. Whoops, sorry. 
which um, contains really various observations. You've got observations on the conditions of ancient Rome and Alexandria and Babylon, um, commentary on uh, Roman authors Virgil and Tertullian, and also subjects like how to travel to the Indies and Japan and the uh, geography of Africa. Um, it's, it's really a catch-all. So I think what you'll note here is the consistent inconsistency of Isaac's work uh, in comparisons with his father in the generation or two after his death were not always flattering for this reason. So we read um, in the early 18th century uh, in the Journal des Trevaux, um, quote, in the father, judgment prevails, in the son, imagination. The father distrusts the best founded conjectures, the son loves nothing but conjectures, and those bold and daring. The father forms his opinions upon what he reads, the son conceives an opinion and then reads. The father's aim was to instruct, the sons to parade and make a noise. Truth was the father's darling object, novelty the sons. The father has written good books, the son has written curious books. Now, especially because we're at Loyola, I will make note of the, the Jesuit orientation of the editorial staff of the journal at the time, which combined with Isaac's professed and demonstrated skepticism for all things Christian, uh, I think set him up pretty well for this type of, of ad hominem attack. There's some great stories there that I won't uh, go into. Uh, but even with this grain of salt, De Pomatum Cantu is surely one of Vossius's curious books. How did he come to publish it at Oxford? Let's take the last step in his basic biography. So he was invited by Charles II to England in 1670, uh, in the early years of the Restoration. He was made a Doctor of Civil Law at Oxford and then a Canon of Windsor in 1673. He evidently delivered this music uh, work, De Poematum Cantu, as a lecture at Oxford in 1670 or 71, which suggests that it was actually conceived and written at The Hague, for what that's worth. Uh, and then he had it published anonymously in 1673. So I regret in my time this morning that, that all of the framing that's necessary, I can hardly do justice to uh, a full idea of what's actually in the treatise, but let's, let's at least look at a top-level summary in the form of my own rough table of contents, and then a few highlights. Um, it's kind of like a Faulkner novel. It just goes and goes and goes with barely even a paragraph break. Um, so in, in the interest of making it a little more readable, um, here are the, uh, the sections, we might say chapters, I guess, at the time. And there's a lot that's, um, that's expected. There are a few things that are unexpected. Um, I will admit, uh, given Julia's talk yesterday, I really hadn't paid much attention to the little section on uh, Galen. Um, in fact, you know, actually titling it in the, in the translation as a digression, but I may need to revisit that given her remarks yesterday. Um, there, there's, there, there's a lot of fascinating uh, material in here and, and authors and, and little bits of authors, uh, Porphyry's commentary on Ptolemy, uh, especially Theophrastus that come in in kind of these later acoustics and, and mechanics of instrument chapters that I don't, I don't know anyone else that has, has done that and, and that has, has gotten those sources uh, together in that way. It's definitely the hardest part to translate. All right, um, so to move on briefly to, um, I guess I'll say the crux um, of his argument in what the treatise is mostly known for, it's, it's Rhythmopoeia argument. So first, he, uh, in the first, these first several things, he really takes them from uh, Mersenne and Descartes earlier in the century. So he agrees with them <coughs> that universal proportion cannot provide any sort of master organizing principle behind music, and it, it really can't do anything with musical expression. Um, he's uh, segueing, as uh, was mentioned in one of the, the Q&A sessions yesterday, uh, into this uh, notion that music's goal is an arousal of, of passions. He's really, he's really fully there. Um, and then also brings in um, some of the, the mechanics of the time. Uh, the passions are mental events separate from reason, and there's a sympathetic vibration sort of uh, me mechanic that makes that happen. Therefore, the task of the composer and the, the philosopher to understand is to discover the best way to make this, uh, make this work, govern the mechanism, and, and influence it. So uh, where I think he builds a bit on his predecessors is in um, not uh, following someone like Burmeister and focusing on the, the figurin, uh, but really focusing on poetic feet. 
very specifically. Uh, of course, in his own um, uh, mind, pro-ancient and anti-modern mind, um, there really hasn't been any decent music since ancient Greece because this, this, um, this mechanic has not been employed by composers. And then um, overall, and this is, this is not an uncommon theme, when used correctly, poetic feet uh, themselves are bearers of that meaning uh, to, to the human spirit. So in these last two, you know, Vossius both highlights the, the, the problem of application and then finds the solution of it by reaching back uh, to, to antiquity. So two more quick curiosities in the work, um, to our mind anyway. Uh, they come up with the two, only the, the two plates that exist in the, the work. So the first reproduces two ancient lyres which are accompanied by a cogent and somewhat prescient argument that the organological excuse me, evidence from ancient statuary or ancient relief really should not be always taken at face value. So he speaks uh, about the elements that are added to human forms in classical statuary, basically saying they're not to scale. Quote, these features should be attributed to the artisans and the sculptors who, as everybody knows during the whole history of art, fashioned swords and spears and anything else that projected outward from the statue in less than full size. Uh, so, you know, part, part of the, the fashion at the time was to, uh, you know, take these uh, classical exemplars as, as gospel truth. These two liars uh, come from two marble statues of, of Apollo that evidently at the time were in Charles II's garden. Um, and, and he uh, transcribed them and provided enough detail in the text to harmonize with ancient descriptions and to create these diagrams. There are two diff different types of harp, the one on the, or lyre, the one on the, the right is the theatrical version because it's got these, these resonating chambers that make it project more, evidently. Um, he, uh, he also uh, uses the detail here to uh, remark on ancient scale systems and also, also to correct some earlier author's ideas on the subject. And he's invoking what I would essentially call an embodied cognition approach. So something like, the scales must have been this way because this is how the fingers would have interfaced with the strings um, on the, the lyre. All right, the second plate is a highly detailed depiction of Vitruvius's water organ, or hydraulis. And this section of De Pomatum Cantu uh, and, and the text surrounding this plate is really a detailed step-by-step -step account of how, how this thing works and how it could actually be built. This is the part of the treatise that I have found to be the most widely cited and quoted and translated um, in the 18th and, and really in the 19th and even the 20th centuries, since it is evidently the most comprehensive and knowledgeable account of ancient water organ construction that's available. Um, and you can get a basic idea how it works. The, the water is just simply provided, providing the pressure and the, the pipes would, would sit in these um, the toe, the toe board up here on top, that's what those little holes are. So it's a self-contained apparatus. So this treatise, uh, I think, hopefully you're getting a sense, is curious indeed. Curious, but not the least noticed of Vossius' works. In uh, Thomas Seacombe's Dictionary of National Biography, late 19th century, we read, quote, what is perhaps the most original of the works of Vossius, appeared anonymously in 1673. So it's called the most original here. Uh, and the summary is the author retraces the ancient alliance between poetry and music and insists upon a strict adherence to the rules of prosody. That's, that's not an unfair uh, summary. Closer to his own time, however, the reviews of the treatise are best maybe viewed through the lens uh, that the only bad critical response is no critical response. So uh, our first response fairly early after his publication by Roger North Quote, the author of this charge writes of, moder of the modern music with as much ignorance as ever yet a base the subject in print, and with a doctoral superciliousness equal to, if not exceeding, his ignorance. Ouch. Oof. Yeah. Uh, and then a little bit later, from John Brown, um, paraphrasing the first part of his statement, aside from a few kernels of wisdom in the treatise, uh, it, it, quote, may be justly thrown aside as husk and shell. Let me end the string of quotations by letting Vossius finally speak for himself. So the treatise is heavy, as I've mentioned, on pro-ancient and anti-modern sentiment like this. Quote, let all the libraries be scoured. We are compelled to acknowledge that the record left to us by antiquity is better. I kind of imagine him you know, banging on the lectern with a shoe or something at the Sheldonian Theater. 
But he also strikes a, a more reasonable, even conciliatory tone here and there, such as, as this, quote, I will be satisfied if the only result I achieve with the treatise is to have today's musician think, musicians think more favorably of the music of the ancients and more modestly when it comes to their own. So, to conclude and hopefully come to something of a full circle, maybe the question is not whether or not Isaac Vossius was sufficiently musical to be a music theorist, but whether music theory in the West had and has remained sufficiently connected with general intellectual inquiry to accept this treatise as music theory. One main reason, or, or perhaps the main reason, that, that Vossius could be seen as a model gatekeeper is that his area of study, classical antiquity, had already ceased to be the lens through which um, all subjects were viewed, or, or the metaphor under which all philosophical inquiry uh, into all those subjects was done. In approaching his subjects this way, music included, I would argue that Vossius actually assumed the identity of an author from classical antiquity. And judging from the more positive strands of his reception during the 18th century, again by Matheson, Rousseau, Forkel, and others, he is essentially treated as one, put up uh, against in lists with Aristides Quintilianus and Quintilian and Ovid and, and uh, Aristoxenus. So he's not treated as a, an ancient author in terms of chronology, of course, but in terms of authority. So my conclusion is that Isaac Vossius, having spent his life immersed in the wisdom of ancient authors, eventually became one himself. And this is more in line with the second answer I, I proposed at the outset. So if we do accept him as a music theorist, I believe we, we have to understand him, husk and shell and all, in that spirit. Thank you. Frank, uh, please have, feel free to have a seat. There's microphones. And now's the Q&A. Thank you both for wonderful talks. Really appreciate it. Uh, Thank someone you. Anyone want to start us off with a question? Or a thought? I have a, a, a thought, maybe. Maybe for Frank, but maybe maybe for both of you. I was really struck in in your paper, Frank, the idea of focusing on pedagogy in sort of the sort of biography and, and reception of a music theorist. Because I feel like there's kind of a increasing attention to like pedagogy in in composer biographies. But despite the fact that you know we all or, or most of us teach, we, we we tend not to think of um, looking at the works of someone's students, you know, in this time as a way of thinking about their theoretical contributions. So I don't, not a question, just a, a thought. Good point, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I think really, and that does not just apply to Reicher, but that's a, maybe, maybe a general tendency in, in certain strands of, of historical theoretical considerations that um, that there is really one perspective that's the print perspective and another perspective that's that's that what is actually taught and how it is taught and one could actually add a performative perspective of what the you know perspective what the what the, the instrument uh, idea of the of the theorist is that depending on what instrument he plays uh, or she um, and uh, I think that really has to be taken into consideration in order to understand really how the theory was understood at its certain time and place. Uh, and more than just you know opening a treatise and seeing oh the person writes this and that and that's what is uh, face value. But you know there's more behind it. And I think that particularly uh, applies to Reicher and requires more research. <coughs> Can we call teaching applied theory? Just not say teaching anymore. Bobby, 
just please. Um, very basic question about redshift. Um, what did he, how did he um, identify himself in terms of nationality, or did he did he identify as, as Czech or Bohemian or German or you know a, adopted Parisian? And if you know, and do you think that that played into in any way his you know not being French, his reception by uh, you know the Hees and Caroline and, and the others? I mean, they were not French either, but. <laughs> Wonderful. That's a central question for the understanding of this whole identity issue with Reicher, and maybe I have not focused enough or at all in that perspective that I presented in my paper. Um, on one hand, we do not have too many you know, authentic biographical or autobiographical information by Reicher. There's always a in-between-the-lines perspective to that. But just from his autobiography, he, he says, the Czech background, he left uh, uh, Prague when he was 11 years old, kind of, kind of in a, uh, at night, jumping on a wagon and leaving. He wasn't very happy there. So later he says, I forgot Czech, Czech, Czech language completely. This is, I, I, this has nothing to do with me. So he kind of really tries to make believe that he ignores that background. Um, his German experience was mixed in that way that his um, stepmother um, was actually French, and so he learned French and German at the same time. So that it was not really a a germ, a, an exclusive German influence. He, he he was bilingual from that perspective. So that helped him later um, having this idea, probably from other musicians that he knew from Bonn. Um, <coughs> Now the name alluded for me, Romberg, the Romberg uh, um, father and son, and Andreas Romberg and such, who probably uh, uh, encouraged him to go to Paris. He all of a sudden is French all over. So he sees uh, dedicating his, his treatises and such to, uh, to the main representatives, Cossack, Meryl, and so on, of the, of the early uh, conservatoire time. So a little bit of, you know, opportunistic adjustment of how he sees himself as an, uh, from a national identity point. Thank you. Uh, question about uh, Vasius. Of course, the, the other place where we most likely to encounter his name is in the, the 300 some odd manuscripts in the Codices of Vasiani um, that have all been digitized now by Friel, et cetera. And, uh, wonderful resources, but it's also remarkable um, wide-ranging the library was. So one question I have is about these sources. Um, and one source in particular, does he care about Augustine's De Musica, which I would imagine uh, he would find a kindred spirit and an insistence on the role of Keats. But also, does he care about the Aristotelian tradition of rhythmics and metrics and some of the complex relationships there uh, with them much more of the Greek side of things? Yeah, that's a great question, and and I've been hoping for for many years to, to go to Leiden and just you know spend like a year there probably combing through the sources and, and looking for you know marginality and that sort of thing. I I, I really would like to see his uh, the copy of Mercenaries from the Universal. I'm, I'm sure that's full of, of great stuff. Um, Augustine does not it does not even seem to be alluded to uh, directly, but. Um, as we were talking beforehand, neither does Kircher, and he, he, he surely knows that work, and, and you can kind of see it around the edges, but he was not in the habit of, uh, and this is, it kind of comes with the territory of the time, he doesn't cite contemporary authors, even though he, he borrows, and in the case of the Harmony of Roussel, um, has some very close paraphrasing for, uh, for large chunks of time um, in, in it. So, um, yeah, and then your, your, the other part of your question, um, he is, he is, you know, obviously a, a, a Grecophile in the extreme. So um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, and I, I could check the index quick, <laughs> whether he, he actually mentions Aristoxenus by name. I mean, Ptolemy, yes, Porphyry, yes, all, all those, um, you know, kind of 
whatever early early um, CE figures. Um, yeah, I will have to check and get back to you. But I, I think that's I think that's that's very fair to say that, that that's what he that's the, the strand he's really picking up on that wasn't picked up on so strongly in, in the folks before him. On the subject of Vossius and his identity, any thoughts on his decision to publish it anonymously? <sighs> Many, none of them <laughs> necessarily are founded. <laughs> Um, I, you know, what was it a thing, and, and I, I guess I'll, I'll throw this question back to the room, um, if you are publishing kind of one-off treatises, is it, is it better for it to, uh, to come out anonymously? Uh, does it have more life? And, and I'll, I'll give some answer to that, in that the treatise actually had more legs uh, in some respects than, than the man who wrote it. So Matheson, quotes it and actually misattributes it to, to the dad. You know, and it was one of those works that seems to have achieved the status of quotability. Um, you know, oh yeah, that, that work about, um, you know, Ripopoia by, by that Dutch guy, Vossius. Oh yeah, it must be Gerhard, right? He's the only one I know. Um, Rousseau, uh, quote, he, he actually, Rousseau, three of the entries in his, his dictionary uh, draw heavily on Vossius and he's, he's cited in the one on, on rhythm. Um, but. Rousseau botches the title of the treatise rather badly. It was clearly the, the, the treatise, but, but he messes up the title. So it, it, kind of, it kind of circulated almost as much by reputation, I think, as by um, you know, kind of someone going and getting it from the library. It also could have been a vanity publication that he, he just did himself and gave out to his friends. Um, again, I don't know how, how common this is. Uh, I'm no expert on the, the publication practices at the time, but a lot of the, the extant copies, there are certain uh, typos that have been corrected clearly at the same time by the same hand. Um, maybe you know, right at the publishing house or, you know, Vossius got them all and was looking them over like, darn it. And went through them all and, and did it. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, the, you know, some of the other strange ones, the one on the, the, the winds and, and tides, he did sign. The one on optics, he's, he, he was attributed. So, it's not his only anonymous treatise, but uh, you know, it, it's not the thing he did. So I don't, I'm curious if anyone else has, has a thought on that. Yeah, please, hi, Ryan. Well, first of all, this is amazing. I've been waiting for a long time for your translation, and I'm really excited to read it. And this talk has even made me more excited. Um, and something that I think you're helping us to realize is that this treatise is actually a little bit different from some of his others, insofar as it might be participating in the quarrel between ancients and moderns, right? Like what Jean de Jean calls, calls ancients and moderns. And, in that sense, I think it actually does make sense as an anonymous publication, mm. rather than something so informational as like on winds and tides, that's gonna be kind of granting him authority in, in that particular field. But this might be kind of like a polemic, you know, you guys are doing it wrong, we lost the ancient way, this is the way to do it. And so, I don't know, maybe you see it as a little bit more polemical in that sense. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I will say that he was, he was not shy about being polemical in right. public. Uh, there's a lot of you know contra policy on uh, on you know this that or the other thing, but that 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 makes complete sense to me. I'll also add that there are some very interesting, I'll say, anticipations of the the 18th century quarrel um, in this treatise that he 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 had his finger on those issues um, quite quite a bit ahead of the time when they came to a head in, in France. So, yeah, but he he's definitely on the ancients side on the ancients team for sure. Um, yeah, no no bones. So yeah, maybe it was better for him to keep his, keep his head down a little bit in that respect. Stefan. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you both. Uh, those are two wonderful case studies. I was wondering, the question, was he a music theorist? If, was what was, was he a music theorist? I wonder if it depends in part to uh, what the disciplinary identity of music theory is at that time. And I wonder if you would comment on that because uh, Obviously, I think that also is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a moving factor, right? I mean, is being a theorist at the time is not the same as, or in, in the Netherlands, it's not the same as being a theorist in Renaissance, Italy, or France. So I, I wonder how, how he saw himself. I don't know if, if he has a sense of what he was actually doing by piling together this enormous amount of uh, knowledge in this, you know, this is uh, like a, a typical polymath. If, if he had, some idea of uh, a 
of his own self-identity was. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, you can, if we can glean it in any way. But, uh, yeah, I might go back to the, the kind of the previous remarks and, and Roger's question that I, I think he saw himself as a champion of the ancient world and then did what many you know, ancient and, and medieval authors did in using music to prove the larger point. Um, so I guess that's, uh, that's where I would say he, he wouldn't claim the, the, the music theorist identity for himself, and, and, but that's maybe even an anachronistic thing to say, like what, was there such a thing where he was at the time? Um, but, it, but it is an interesting moment of transition, right? I mean, the, the, the you know, early Restoration Civil War period that we were kind of segueing uh, rather rapidly. So I mentioned Kierkegaard before, who probably would adopt, uh, would have adopted the, the mantle of uh, you know, music scholar or whatever, um, but was similarly broad in his, his writings and, and knowledge uh, than Vossius. Um, and just you know, really a generation later, I guess, Vossius is doing something different because the context is that different. Um, and maybe Kierkegaard's context is just that different from uh, England. You know, we forget about the time, the time difference too. Um, so yeah, I think, and I, I guess it was Andrew yesterday that talked about the right to pivot uh, at this point away from, from ancient sources as, as the authority. Uh, and, uh, it, it's, it's funny because Isaac's halfway there. You know, he's, he's talking about the, the passions and he's adopting these rather more modern, at least 17th century ways of thinking about music. But at the same time, it's, it, you know, the, the connection, why that's important is ancient as well. You know, numerical proportion isn't important anymore. That's not why we go back to the ancient world. We go back for precisely the, the topics of the day. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Can I ask a question? Um, Vasya, see, Understandably, we spent a lot of time on kind of uh, reception of the son in relation to the father, and we can identify him in a certain way via that relationship. Is there, but there was overlap in their publication history, so is there a sense of what the father thought of the son? <laughs> That's a great question, and I haven't, I haven't seen anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, yeah. yeah uh, not, not even a hint that they were, you know, estranged, or, no, or yeah, even, yeah. even intellectually. You know, estranged is estranged as far as their, their approaches. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, you quoted one person as saying that um, you, you know, the father, that the son really preserves what the father is doing. You know, the father in a sense is a trailblazer. But then there's another quote about the son. You know, uh, I forget the the final word that you know put the nail in the coffin. But uh, the son is, uh, you know, kind of being avant garde for avant garde's sake almost. You know, so that might rela uh, relate to it somehow. There's a bit of tension there in the two interpretations. Yeah, I, when your father's a modernist composer, you have to be a postmodernist composer. I mean, <laughs> it's just not that simple. I don't know. No, but it, it definitely brings up this question of identity and generations of, you know, both literal and figurative sons of the fathers, and you know, it's very interesting how how you strike out on your own. question of who is a music theorist and is Vossius one, um, but I, I want to ask you what is the definition in your mind working with his writings of what is music theory? I mean, to this room, <laughs> maybe I could say, you know, compiling uh, assembling and understanding what has come before is is absolutely uh, a, one definition of music theory, and and by that definition, 100 percent yes. Um, you know, if if we think of it more as as system building and and, and clarity and uh, you know a, a logical argument, eh, not so much. So um, I'm I'm certainly willing to to go with the, the first, um, but I'm not sure that that's where our discipline is as a whole at this moment. Again, happy to. Have, have people opine on that from the group here too. It's, yeah, it's an important question to consider because just for, I, I think it applies to what you're doing and also I've done a fair amount of work on writings about jazz um, before
before people thought of the field of jazz theory. And so what were those things? And so it, it applies to so many different things. And even when you get the question of theorizing, but the person who's <coughs> doing it might not think that they are, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, are the Kaluli of Papua New Guinea theorists, music theorists, you know, uh, so it's, it, it's a question that applies in so many areas, and if we're not thinking about that question, I think that's what you're your whole, this whole uh, uh, conference is about, is not just the identity of the people we're studying, but um, the identity of the field and our position in it. Yeah, I think that's, that's very well put. And, and you mentioned jazz. I was just speaking yesterday with um, uh, Clay, I think it was here, who's oh, yeah, yeah. done some work on Eric Dolphy and, and you know, barely anything written by, by, by him, but there is, you could say that there is theorizing going on in what he wrote and, and how he did it, and, and you can see his process through his, um, the manuscript uh, trail that we have. So, yeah, it, it's a big, big question. We, we, we can certainly look elsewhere than just the, the publications. Yeah. Is the point, what do you make of the answer? I mean, why does it matter if he is or he isn't? And yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's, I, I think it's completely separable whether um, the writer is a theorist and whether the, the writing or the statement is theory. And um, so whether or not Vossius considered himself as a music theorist, um, I just, for myself, I have a very broad definition of theory. You know, is it about music? Check. Uh, right. Does it say anything about the organization or, you know, materials of, of music or composition? Check, you know. And so uh, I hope that we'll, you know, all be bringing a lot more into the consideration of music theory right. than, as you said, the field already does. Right. I, I would just say, I mean, I think, I think Vasius would be confused by the question. Um, and I mean, I would, I imagine, you know, he would have, maybe he doesn't, but other, other models maybe, you know, Cardano's case of Duritate, which has, you know, big chunks on, on music and Scaliger's reply to it, et cetera. You know, I don't think we would have arguments about whether Cardano and, and Scaliger are music theorists, et cetera. And I think Vasius really belongs within that kind of polymathic, Man of letters, et cetera, space, which means that music is fully within you know, the domain that, that could be that could be broached. So it's a question of our time that we're trying to answer, and there's something to be learned from examining the historical record in, in doing so. Right. But essentially for us it means how seriously shall we take him? Right. <laughs> because if we decide a priori that he's not, you know, he's a pony man, so you may read it in a different way from the a priori that if you're reading, you know, someone that, that we think to be, you know, an Artuzzi or a Zalino or a Ramon. Right. So it, right there, you just approach these texts differently. I actually have a question for Frank, if I may. Um, kind of on that note that, you know, I mean, we're, we're what, 150 years essentially between, between the, the two folks we're talking about. Has the definition of, or has the uh, the horizon of knowledge expanded so much that when we get to Reich's time, that he is essentially a polymath in his own context, writing as he did in, in the kind of the three main ways that I, I think you you drew from um, a, another author early on in the talk, um, and I, I, it's part of the larger question of you know, increasing specialization. Right now, now in the early nineteenth century, if if there's you know. Eight billion things to know instead of one billion things to know. You know what? What counts is if you still know one billion of those eight. Are you still are, are you a polymath in that context? I think he tries to be a polymath in that sense, but in a very different sense from that sure. uh, century, because of course the you know um, Enlightenment influence which he which he plays on. To 
identify himself as a humanistic, but in that sense, modern technical uh, uh, theorist. So what does that mean? I think in his aesthetic considerations, as he often calls and subtitles uh, some of his writings, he often tries to tries to show that you know if you do this right, then you will be a better human being. You know, mm -hmm. in that sense, almost you know, in that naive sense, sounding a bit naive, but it, he ha he has always this attempt to uh, to justify technical aspects of music theory as something <coughs> that makes you better. So again, that's a pedagogical thing, maybe, you know. On the other hand, it's it's very interesting. What did he actually publish out of this uh, stuff that he is? And it is only the, to, to make it simple, it's only the technical part. So the, he has a huge French manuscript written before the Traité de Mélodie, uh, which is called uh, something like Philosophical Aesthetic Considerations, mm -hmm. and that remains manuscript. Do you have a sense of why it wasn't published? I think by that time he wanted to buy into the uh, structures of academia at that time, especially the conservatoire. He wanted a job, and so he needed to show he's an expert in counterpoint. That's what counts, and not philosophizing right. out there somewhere. tendency of polymath is in there and he tries to identify himself very much in the early times, but later not so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. August again, please. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the framing of Rossius as, as engaged in a, in a polemic in a modern, makes a lot of sense. But I, I was struck by one of the items in your table of contents, both for its not sure where it would fit into that, which is the Chinese versus European song. <laughs> and just wondered if you could say any more about it. Yeah, um, th there's actually a, a term I've run across uh, to describe, uh, yeah, I guess it's mostly a continental thing uh, in, that, in that part of the 17th century, Sinophoneticism. It's a great, it's a great one of those great words. Uh, and and Vossius was had a serious case of it. I mean, he, he couldn't die with it, I think it was so bad, yeah. Um, there's, there's a quote, uh, Actually, um, Abbe Dubot, one of the folks that, that cites um, you know, his, his work in the 18th century, says, yeah, there's this interesting treatise. It's on you know, rhythm and, and meter and poetry. And here's the title. And I think it's by Isaac Vossius because it's got all of these prejudices in favor of China. And everyone knows that this guy was crazy about China. So it, it actually became kind of a, a calling card to, yeah. uh, to posterity. Um, and uh, th that's the only kind of the only mention in the treatise that kind of rose to the level of uh, of a whatever a, a, a section title because it, it, it goes on for a little bit. But there are other mentions of um, actually in the, the section on Galen and, and pulse theory, um, he he says, "Oh, the European doctors will kill you." You know, the Chinese doctors really understand all this much better than than our, our doctors do. So I and I don't, I don't really know much about where that comes from at that, um, at that time period or where he got it from in particular. But he's definitely on the, again, if, if anyone else knows more about that uh, side alley of it, uh, I'm interested to know. I think, sorry, if there's time for one more question. Um, I've lost track of time myself, so oh, I have plenty of time. I, I do not know more about um, <laughs> the perception of Chinese song in this time, but, um, I did have one more question for Frank. I was very curious about the, the autobiographical sketch. And I'm just, when when was that from? I'm just trying to place it in connection with other, like the, the phenomenon of bi composer biography and autobiography. Reicher dictated that draft. It's really just a draft. He dictated it to one of his students. Um, what's his first name? Blanchard is the last name. Is probably one doesn't know exactly, but that was his kind of his assistant, his teaching assistant, you would say today. 
Almi, in uh, 1824. So right before he publishes the uh, 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 his, his, his latest uh, treatise on Credida uh, uh, or Composition Musicale, so the, the counterpoint, roughly spoken, the counterpoint treatise, um, the third one of, the, of that row of uh, French treatises. Um, it's really not very well known for what reason, maybe for for advertisement, for publication. He was by that time a kind of famous, you know, famous theorist. But it was not published. It was, it was again, you know, that that uh, lack of scholarly work about Reicher. It took into the, I think, into the nineteenth, uh, into the twentieth century that uh, a first, a, interestingly, a Czech uh, translation was published in the nineteen thirties or so, and um, it, took, it took quite a quite a while before before it came out, and. Yeah, it took till 2011 that this, this series of, of, of uh, editions that we have a scholarly edition of the, of the, of the biography. And it is um, insofar a draft as it's written uh, both in first person and third per person singular. So mixed, so it must have been dictated at different times and as it was typical in, in yeah. fact, in some houses, he did this and he did that, and then in another part, you know, oh, I studied and so on. So it, it's very weird. I'm thinking there might be an interesting comparison with uh, Ignaz von Lutzow's Salieri biography, which yeah. is also from the 20th and based on interviews um, and partial dictations of yeah. reminiscences. It's a good point. It, there's no real evidence for it, but it could have been a, 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 the, the original idea to to, uh, to uh, write a bio biography and so to get uh, autobiographical information for that, but there's no real uh, evidence for that. We have plenty of time, but we could also pause here unless there are other questions. Thank you so much. On the China thing I neglected to mention, sorry, I'm going to give you whiplash here going back and forth. Um, really, I think the, the best context to understand that all of that part of the, the, the treatise is that it's yet another um, bit of evidence in favor of the ancients. So ancient Europeans, we had it, we screwed it up, we've lost it for the last 12 centuries. The Chinese had it and still have it. So we should really follow the model. That's, that's the basis. Thank you again. Thank you so much.